All right, so this is my lower respiratory long lecture. Um, so this is more of a full video, uh, lengthy video, I'm sure it will be, um, to start to go into uh, lower respiratory disorders. So think lung disorders. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the big four like pneumonia, COPD, asthma, and tuberculos tuberculosis. I'm gonna talk about some other miscellaneous disorders like acute bronchitis, pleural effusion, environmental lung disease, atelectasis, stuff like that as well. And yes, there's more meds as all these is. Um, so um, hopefully this helps if you're looking for more short, sweet, simple videos, you've already been to your lecture, not looking for another lecture, Sure, check out um, playlists under unit one, you'll find more simpler videos. But if you're looking for something lengthy and exhausting, you're in the right place. <laughs> so um, acute bronchitis. Um, so this is a lot of times people mix this up with chronic bronchitis, which is similar to COPD, but acute bronchitis is a lower respiratory issue um, of the bronchioles or the bronchi, I should say. Um, and so it's where there is a acute inflammation. It's usually as a result of a virus, but um, it can be as a result of like exposure to chemicals, if you're um, from smoking, um, allergens and stuff as well. And usually the defining symptom for this is gonna be a persistent cough or a cough that doesn't go in. Usually it lasts for months. People are like, I've been coughing for months and um, it can be productive, et cetera. It can just be a nagging cough. Um, they also might have a fever that can feel weak or they may complain of chest pressure with breathing. Um, what we're going to teach them is going to be to avoid irritants. So if they are around chemicals or they're smoking, they definitely need to stop that. And then, um, if possible, of course, and then um, infection prevention as well uh, to try to prevent themselves uh, from getting these viruses and, you know, hand washing, avoiding um, uh, what do you call it, um, crowds and sick people and things like that as well. Most of the treatment for it is just supportive because you cannot give antibiotics for a virus. Um, so we usually just uh, like encourage fluids for them to thin their secretion, which makes it easier to cough that stuff up and then treat the symptoms. And I talked about in my last lecture for upper respiratory that, you know, this is one of the cases where we might use antitussives or tussives, however you say that. Um, like Tessalon pearls or the dextamorphan, I can't say it, of course, when I'm trying to say it, I can never can, but it sounds so good in my head when I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so, um, but cough suppressants, we may use these because sometimes it's been nagging them for so long they can't even sleep because of the cough. Um, so yeah, it's mostly just supportive care. All right, so now let's talk about pleural effusion. So pleural effusion, you always wanna think about where is the problem happening? So pleural effusion is fluid um, around the outside. Think of it as like hugging the outside of the lung. Um, it's, it's in the pleural space. Um, it's, I should say the outside of the lung. It's hugging, it's hugging um, what do you call it? Um, it's fluid accumulating in the space in between the outer sac of the lung and the inner sac. Um, and um, usually it's gonna be an indication that there's a problem somewhere else. So usually it's a sign of infection, like it's, it can happen in acute pancreatitis. It can happen when people have lung infections. It can happen when people have GI issues um, like liver disease. Um, um, it can happen with patients that have kidney disease or have fluid where it's not so, supposed to be in, in heart disease as well. Um, usually what these patients are going to complain about is that they can't breathe. They're having shortness of breath because it's kind of like I said, it's like hugging that lung to where the lung cannot expand the way it needs to. So you're not going to be oxygenating as well as you would like to. Um, they can commonly have diminished breath sounds because literally you're just like putting your stethoscope over and listening right over that fluid. You're not going to be able to hear anything. There's no air passing through there. Um, and they also, especially if it's infected, they can have um, signs of infections like fever and things like that. So this is um, not something that's going on in Inside the lung, but like like where they're going to be coughing stuff up, um, but um, it's fluid around the lung that's pretty much restricting them from being able to um, take nice deep breaths and um, oxygenate the way they want to. Like I said, it's also sometimes paired with there's an infection, and when there's infection in that fluid in that pleural effusion, it's what's called loculated pleural effusion. Um, and so, and the only way we know that is if we tap some of that um, fluid out and test it and see if it has anything growing in it. Um, so the main treatments, this is a fluid issue and the fluid restricting my lung from being able to expand. Um, so I need to treat the fluid issues and then I also need to make sure they're oxygenating well. Um, so I might give them supplemental oxygen as needed and keep their head of bed elevated to allow for better expansion of their lungs um, and then get rid of the fluid. So um, we do this through diuretics. Uh, often we do a thoracentesis or um, where we go in and do a needle aspiration. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, and sometimes they, after the needle aspiration or 
just in general, they're going to need a chest tube because a lot of times if that fluid's accumulating, especially if it's an infectious cause, it's going to keep coming back. So a lot of times they need a chest tube for a little bit, whether it's a pigtail, a small tube, or um, something a little bit bigger um, for uh, drainage of that fluid so that we can um, get that lung expanding the way it's supposed to. If there is an infection, they may need antibiotics. Again, we'll have to do a culture first, kind of see if there is anything growing and if so, what, and um, you know, tailor that therapy um, to help with that. And then aside from that, you know, they may, if they have a fever, other symptoms may give them stuff like acetaminophen, et cetera. So thoracentesis, so this is where they go in and commonly for thoracentesis, we have them sitting up in kind of like a tripod position in order to, um, to get this. So if they can sit up in the upright position and trust me, um, even with some patients that you're like, oh, well, it's not gonna be easy. Well, as long as they can do it, I've sat there for you know 30 minutes while they've done a thoracentesis and held an intubated patient sitting up on a bedside table. <laughs> so um, we definitely do this even if a patient's not um, great with sitting up, as long as it's safe, um, we're gonna try to do that. We're gonna do it ultrasound guided. So we're not just going and poking around at nothing, you know, and saying, I think it's about here. Um, we're gonna go in, they're gonna um, find that fluid and they're gonna use the ultrasound and mark their spots and um, go in and drain that fluid. It should be a color kind of like this, um, kind of like a serious color. Um, they're gonna get a local anesthetic they, um, to be numbed. And um, this really isn't painful. They may feel pressure. Um, they may disagree, but um, it's usually just like pressure and discomfort that they're feeling. We don't take a lot of fluid out of the lungs. When we talk about in a, a paracentesis, like for liver patients, which you'll learn about in complex, we can, I've seen up to 23 liters taken off of a patient's abdomen. We do not do that with the lung. There's not a lot of um, room for um, fluid in the lung. And um, we're gonna talk about some side effects of taking off a bunch of fluid from a patient. Um, so, but for these patients, usually we're taking about a liter of fluid out, maybe a little over a liter at most. Um, and we usually ask for it via syringe. And like I said, after that, they may um, attach a chest tube to that, um, uh, this needle and stuff here. They'll like, they'll put in what's called a pigtail um, or um, they'll insert a chest tube pretty much in the same place where they drain this fluid um, and use that as a port in order to continue to drain fluid. Um, and then they'll send off this for specimen and to see what's growing if and what's in it too. Because sometimes we just want to see what's going on in there. Um, we're going to watch out for signs of a problem as the nurse. I really need to be watching out for low blood pressure. I'm taking off a liter of fluid off this patient. So I need to be watching their blood pressure closely. Uh, and then it's always very possible that the doctor can unbeknownst to them, uh, poke, uh, puncture the lung and cause a pneumothorax. So I'm going to listen for that. I would look for absent lung sounds, not diminished, but completely absent lung sounds or increased work of breathing, especially if it was a tension pneumothorax, they might have the um, deviated trachea and stuff like that as well. So I'm definitely looking for those signs of respiratory problems or cardiovascular problems as well as a result of draining that fluid. So um, then there's pleurisy, or I call it pleurisy because pleurisy isn't easy. Um, and this is an inflammation of your pleural space. And so in that space where there was fluid for pleural effusion, now it's just inflamed. And this happens if there is infection. Um, it's kind of like, think of it like, it's like a grating, like where the, the two pleura are rubbing against each other. Um, and there's just that narrow space, like you can see in this picture. And most commonly we see this in patients that have cancer or getting radiation treatments, things like that. And it's kind of like it's like a radiation burn or as a result of that, but it can also be from trauma as well. And what this patient's going to complain about is an abrupt, sharp pain. It's going to be worse when they take a breath in, like <gasps> when they breathe in, they're going to, they're going to usually complain that the pain is worse then. Um, they're going to have kind of a squeaking door sound when you listen to their lung sounds called a pleural friction rub. Um, and um, uh, what do you call it? That's something that you can listen for with your stethoscope. And then, um, the treatment for it, it's an inflammation. So we're going to give anti-inflammatories such as NSAIDs. And we haven't talked about NSAIDs much yet, um, but just the kind of general teaching to know with NSAIDs is that you always wanna take it uh, with food because it can irritate the stomach. Uh, monitor for GI bleeding because it does increase your risk of bleeding and it can be a little hard on the kidneys. So whereas acetaminophen is hard on the liver, NSAIDs are more hard on the kidneys. Um, so we kind of watch those closely and more we're worried about the GI bleeding and GI upset. And then I'm gonna tell you two things for pleurisy that may sound confusing. We're gonna tell them to lie on the side that hurts and to splint. Um, and lying on the side that hurts is actually a way of splinting. Um, and so the point there, like, let's say that I had pleurisy on this side. Um, it may seem like, oh, why would you wanna lay on that side? Isn't that gonna hurt worse? Well, it's not something that's external here and it may be a little sore to lay on that side, but it's actually gonna be super helpful because if I lay on this side and split this side, 
when I start to expand, if there's like pressure against it, my lung is not going to expand or like, you know, I'm not going to have as much room for expansion. So it's going to decrease my pain. And here's the thing is, is yes, we want really good lung expansion. We want them taking deep breaths, but their pain is so bad. Sometimes with this, they cannot take a deep breath and I want them breathing for sure. And so sometimes splinting is a way to get them to try, like, uh, uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say is as much as splinting may seem like it restricts the lung movement, a lot of times it actually allows for better lung movement than without splinting. So without a pillow, I might just be able to be like, it hurts too bad to breathe anymore. But with a, with a split, with a pillow, I could go, I could breathe a little bit more. So it's really to encourage it. And so um, anytime with this, and you'll learn about this more in complex, but when you have like really bad, like rib fractures, it may seem counterintuitive um, because you want them to breathe more and breathe deep. Um, but sometimes I have to give them opioids or other stronger pain medicines. I'm not talking about for pleurisy. They may need that, but usually it's just anti-inflammatories, but needless to say, um, like I'm talking about rib fractures, like things like that. We give them pain medicine, but we give them that because that's the only way they're going to take a deep breath. So it's the same kind of concept here. The only way that a lot of times these people are going to take a deeper breath is if they have that splinting or that putting that pressure, because it's going to allow for less, a little less expansion on that side, um, or like help to put, put counter pressure on that pain. So also if you like labor and delivery, it's like counter pressure on the back when they're having, people are having back labor. I don't know a lot about labor, so don't ask me any questions. Um, I mean, I've been in labor, but I don't know a lot about labor and delivery nursing, but I, that's like the one thing I think I still remember. <laughs> so yes. And I might be totally messing it up and I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, anyway, and then we want to treat the underlying cause. So, you know, a lot of times if it's the cancer treatments, we might have to put those on hold for a little while or figure out something else or something different to do. And then if there's infection, we will treat it. So now let's go into some of the bigger guns. Let's talk about pneumonia. Um, so pneumonia is an acute infection of the parenchyma. Um, which I used to call the parenchyma when I was in my early days. So don't worry, we all have words that we take a few years to learn. <laughs> but in the parenchyma, um, is, uh, it's pretty much, it's happening in the place where oxygen exchange occurs or down in the alveoli, alveoli I could talk, um, alveoli. And um, so it's gonna cause you to have difficulties with gas exchange. Um, and so effectively, um, uh, what, when we're talking about uh, problems here is it's like we're really going to be worried about oxygenation with this patient. And we also talked in acid, well, we, uh, I guess at this point, we haven't talked about acid base yet. So um, we called um, acid, um, in acid base, we also talk about that um, with, they're at risk for respiratory acidosis. So uh, when they have pneumonia, so they also can have trouble with CO2 as well, getting that, all that CO2 out because there's poor gas exchange. Think of it like all these alveoli, like normally oxygen can get in, CO2 can get out. But when they're inflamed, get full of fluid, full of infection, it's really hard to get oxygen in and it's hard to get the other waste gases out. Um, there's just a bunch of junk in there. So um, this is going to be caused, it can be bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia, fungal pneumonia, parasitic pneumonia. Um, most often it's going to be bacterial or viral, but it does come in a sort. And so, um, and you can have one and get a different type too. Um, risk factors for this are going to be older age. Our muscles are weaker where um, we can aspirate more easily. People that are more sleepy. So like after surgery, uh, people that are drunk, things like that, they're going to be more at risk for pneumonia. Um, people that are on medications that suppress their immune system are going to be more at risk to get this since it is an infection. Um, people that are intubated because they have a straight shot into their airway, which increases their risk for um, getting infection straight into their lungs. Um, and people that are on enteral tube feedings because they're going to be at risk for aspiration pneumonia. Um, one of the most common causes of pneumonia is atelectasis. So this is something else we're going to see. So this is kind of a side topic in pneumonia. Um, but um, a lot of times when patients are in the hospital, they're not taking deep breaths. Maybe they just had surgery or like we talked about, like the rib fractures, they don't want to take deep breaths. And when your alveoli are not being used, you're not taking deep breaths, they collapse. Um, and so um, what we're going to hear is diminished breath sounds. Diminished does not mean gone. It just means very like faint or hard to hear. And it's usually going to be in the lower lobes, which is where your alveoli are. Um, and so we can treat the, most of the, um, most of the treatment, of course, is going to be like, hey, you need to take deep breaths. So we use like the incentive spirometer um, and then do other things that are going to encourage you to take deep breaths, like turning every two hours and early mobility is key. But mostly what we want to do is prevent this, which is why we do the incentive spirometer. We turn regularly and we do early mobility before the atelectasis happens. But anyway, that's just another, um, look, when you think atelectasis, like what can happen with it, your first thought should be pneumonia. Cause usually one of the first side effects of, like one of the first consequences of atelectasis is gonna be pneumonia. 
So what we, I was just talking about, you know, there's bacteria and stuff that gets in. And see, so look at this like fluid that can't, like nothing can get in here um, because there's all this junk in here. And so inflammation occurs. And when inflammation occurs, these gases cannot get exchanged um, here in this airway, in this alveoli, the way that they used to be able to. Um, so oxygen cannot get, get in and like that's the bigger issue. Yes, we have, do have trouble getting rid of waste too, um, but we're most concerned about that oxygenation getting in because it can get very severe. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that bacteria or viruses, et cetera, can reach the lungs. So first is by aspiration. Um, so when I'm talking about aspiration, I'm talking about that maybe either like it can be like someone who's drunk, they drink too much, they pass out and then they vomit and they end up like um, choking on their um, secretions. Could be someone who's chewing on something and chokes on it. But it can also be people that have reflux or on tube feedings, things like that, that have um, that content moves from their stomach or just to have stomach acid in general. And that content moves from their stomach and goes up and lands in their respiratory tract. What happens is your respiratory tract should be a fairly sterile area. You should not be getting bacteria. Well, unless you're inhaling it, of course. But what I mean is, is that like you're not going to usually have food or other, um, you know, bacteria in there from those kind of contents. So um, what happens is when that content gets in there, that infection lives and breeds. And um, that's where pneumonia comes from. Uh, and that's one, well, so to say that's one way pneumonia comes in. So um, that's why a lot of um, managing pneumonia is gonna be managing some of those risk factors for aspiration, especially those people we know that are at high risk. There's also um, uh, pneumonia as a result of inhalation. So I'm just walking around either in the hospital or maybe out at, um, in the community and someone coughs or um, you know, breathes near me that has uh, pneumonia and I end up swallowing in some of those particles and I can get it that way. And then it also can spread from other organs. So if I have a serious infection, like an infective endocarditis, which is a sad, sad infection of inside my heart, um, that it can be pushed in the bloodstream all the way through my, to my lungs, which can then um, lead to an infection in my lungs. So what does this patient complain about or look like? Um, so it's going to look a lot like influenza except it's lower respiratory symptoms. So they're gonna have the cough, the purulent sputum sometimes, which that's more like purulent sputum is more lower respiratory. Um, whereas like with influenza, they usually don't have this unless things are getting worse. Um, they can have the fever. Um, but then this is where it starts to get different. Remember, we talked about that a patient with influenza will start to um, like, well, I'll start to be worried about pneumonia if they start having problems breathing. Oxygenation issues should cue you in your head. Hey, there's a lung problem going on. They might be getting pneumonia. Um, but pneumonia patients, a lot of times they're going to have problems. They're going to complain of shortness of breath, dyspnea. They may be using accessory muscles, et cetera. Um, they can have chest pain when breathing. It can be hard to breathe because um, what do you call it? Um, pneumonia can lead to inflammation. Um, and the air passages as well. And then they commonly, you should think when you're thinking lung sounds, wet or core sounds are going to be a sign of, um, uh, of infection um, or fluid. Um, whereas we'll talk later about asthma and COPD and those are gonna be those wheezes. So a patient with pneumonia should not have wheezes. That'd be, um, that would have to be an outside issue. The wet or core sound is that fluid that's accumulating in the lungs as a result of that um, infection. So we talked about influenza can lead to pneumonia. So what can happen after pneumonia? So pneumonia can lead to complete respiratory failure, which means whatever my efforts are as a human being on my own power are not enough to sustain me and allow me to breathe um, the way that I need to in order to be okay. So I'm gonna look for, everything's getting worse. Worsening, worsening dyspnea, um, increased respiratory effort, increased respiratory rate, maybe a new fever, I was getting better, now I'm getting worse. And then especially when older patients, but all patients, decreased level of consciousness. We'll learn about this in neuro, but usually one of the earliest indicators that something's not right um, in my body is the change in level of consciousness, especially if like, cause the body's just very, sen the, mind, the brain is very sensitive. Like if it's not getting flow and stuff that it needs, um, it's gonna just shut down and say, okay, I need a break. Um, and then, of course, decreased oxygenation, especially if they were getting worse and now they're, uh, they're getting better and now they're getting worse. So they also can get a secondary infection. Um, then um, fluid accumulation in the lungs um, can happen, you know, like a pleural effusion can happen. They can get the pleurisy. Um, they can get a collapsed lung or a pneumothorax, or they can have inflammation of the, I uh, already said the inflammation of the lung cavity or the pleurisy. Um, so if you just kind of reminder of some of these symptoms, because this is really important as a nursing student, like you can sit there and make a flashcard that says, hey, here are the side effects of this disease process. But if you don't actually know what they look like, nine times out of 10, we're not going to say, hey, what's a consequence? We're going to say, hey, patient has pneumonia. Here's these symptoms. What are you worried about? Or what could be happening? 
happening or what are you going to do about it? So you always want to know anytime you're studying complications, you always need to study what are the signs that um, the patient is um, getting worse. Like what is it actually going to look like? Okay, so they can have a pneumothorax, but what is that going to look like? Okay, they can go into respiratory failure, but what is that going to look like? But anyway, um, so decreased breath sounds or absent breath sounds, they can have pain on inspiration, um, which is when they're taking a breath in, um, worsening dyspnea or decreased oxygenation are all signs of some of these problems. So those are going to be some of your warning signs that the pneumonia is getting worse. So how do we diagnose it? Um, we can look at at uh, the chest x-ray and us as the nurse, I mean, I can just look and uh, I'm not a x-ray person. I have no, and that's not even like a really good way to say that. I am not a radiologist. <laughs> and so, um, but I'm not gonna sit there and try to diagnose because every time I do, when I'm at my job and I'm looking at these, I'm like, oh, it looks like it's getting worse. And then the doctor comes up, oh, it's looking better. So I'm always like, well, forget it. But what I will tell you is one thing I do know is you want in the lungs to be black. Black means air is moving in and out. So when we have all these white patchy things, um, there are things that are called consolidation or infiltrates, things like that. I do not want that because that is a sign that I have some gunk in my lungs. Um, so I know we want black here. So that's the one thing I will say. Um, you also might look for signs of difficulty getting oxygen in or acid base imbalances. So I might get an ABG. Remember, we're going to be looking up for that respiratory acidosis. Is going to be what's most common. Now, these patients are breathing faster, so it's possible there'll be an alkalosis, but more than likely, as because a result of pneumonia, it will be acidosis. We're also going to look for infection um, through getting a sputum culture. And that's like the most definitive, like a culture is always going to be the most direct way to tell that someone has an infection right now. Because it's saying, hey, right now, the sputum that you have in your body has this growing in it versus anything else. I can look at a white blood cell count and say, hey, it's elevated, but it doesn't tell me where the infection is or if it's right now or if I'm recovering from it. And you can also have an elevated white blood cell count from a number of other things like inflammation um, or medications. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to look for infection. Then I'm also going to look for complications. Um, so I'm going to look for things like uh, electrolyte imbalances. A lot of these patients with pneumonia, they're going to be so tired, they haven't been able to eat or drink. So they can have imbalances there. And if they're not drinking, they could be dehydrated. So I need to check their kidney function as well. So I'll get a chemistry, a BMP or CMP, and look at that creatinine, um, and then check for their potassium, their magnesium, et cetera. Uh, and then I want to see is infection spreading because pneumonia can commonly spread other places or maybe it came from somewhere else. So I might get blood cultures as well to see if infection is becoming widespread, especially if they have a very high fever or showing um, other systemic like cardiovascular symptoms like shock, um, like low blood pressure and high heart rate. So medications to manage infection. We need to get rid of the intruder. So if there is, um, if it, I'm going to talk about some antibiotics. Um, so we can do those. Um, you don't have to know in depth about the antifungals, antivirals, and these, this is like as surface level as I'm going to tell you about antibiotics. And this is really as in depth as you really need to know. It's just kind of some of the common things because all of these have a million different interactions and other things, but just kind of knowing some of the life or death stuff in the common stuff you'll want to know as a nurse. Um, so these are all antibiotics, but not all pneumonia is bacterial. So you always have to treat it for what it is. If it's a viral pneumonia, I maybe can give antivirals, but a lot of times we just kind of manage it. Fungal pneumonia will give antifungals, et cetera. <clears throat> so some common antibiotics or antibiotic classes, one of the most common ones will give us what's called vancomycin. And what we're gonna watch for with vancomycin is what's called red man syndrome. And this is where they get a widespread head to toe rash. Um, and it's an allergic, uh, it's an allergic inflammatory reaction. Um, and we definitely want to stop it if they're getting this reaction and we're gonna have to treat that. We always wanna give vancomycin slow so we don't push it. IV push, it's always given slow, IV, um, uh, IV through a pump, I can talk, um, and um, as a, because if it's given too fast, it can cause hypotension and it also can cause ototoxicity um, or hearing loss. Um, and so we want to be very careful with this med and make sure that it's going in a good IV, et cetera. There's also a class called beta lactams. Um, these are have kind of like when we talked about with latex allergies, how there's certain foods that if you're allergic to certain foods, you're probably allergic to latex and vice versa. It's the same with these and penicillins. Um, so people that are allergic to beta lactams are also commonly allergic to penicillins as well. Um, so um, all of these and have psyllin in them, if that helps you to remember it. So, but you always want to ask them about an allergy to penicillin with these. Um, with the macrolids, 
Um, this is like erythromycin or azithromycin. We always want to know their cardiac function because they can be cardiotoxic. And you're going to kind of see like all of these have some sort of toxicity to some organ. And the fluoroquinolones, um, like levofloxin or levoquin, um, they can be toxic to the heart, the liver, and the brain. So definitely want to um, know the function, make sure that they're doing okay there. That's something a pharmacist is usually going to look into as well before these are given. But um, you always, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, always want to keep in mind that uh, you, you're the last person to check before at the end of the day. So if you have any concerns, don't be afraid to bring them up with the doctor. So let's talk about, excuse me, um, general antibiotic precautions. So antibiotics usually need a lot of monitoring. Um, in other words, um, you know, I, I have to kind of know what's going on before in the body. And um, these, are, these are general stuff that I'm gonna do for all antibiotics, just general precautions and things. Um, first and foremost, I always have to get a culture first and then give antibiotics. And the purpose of that is because if I start giving the antibiotics, like let's say that I need to get a sputum culture, but I can't get them to cough anything up. And I'm not, well, I don't like to use that as an example because that really does happen and sometimes we do wait. But let's say that someone comes in and they have an infection in their bloodstream. I have to draw their blood first and get that blood and see what's growing first. Otherwise, if I start giving antibiotics, that bacteria can start to die. And then I don't actually know what's growing inside of them. In other words, it can alter the results. So we prefer to get the culture first. In real life, there are times, sometimes it's hard, we can't get anyone to that stuff up. But um, uh, I will tell you, in nursing school world, we always can get it. We can always get a specimen. So just assume in real life that we can always get that um, specimen first. So we always want to do that because otherwise we're going to alter our results and we're not going to really know what's growing. Or it might come back that the culture is negative, even though there is there was something growing, but you killed it with those antibiotics that you gave. Um, so culture first, then antibiotics. I'm sorry, I've been talking too much today, too many of these lectures. Um, there's also a risk of what's called MDRO or multi-drug resistant organisms. Um, so we're going to be worried about um, C. diff. So you always want to, and you're going to kind of see this as a theme throughout the semesters. Anytime we're talking about um, antibiotics, if there's a patient that um, is on antibiotics and then starts having GI or uncomfortable gastrointestinal symptoms, we always want to tell them to report those because if they're having those, it can be a sign that they're getting C. diff, which is a... Um, drug resistant organism. And um, effectively what's happening is, is that the antibiotics go in and they kill the bad bacteria that we want it to kill, but it also kills some good GI bacteria and leads you to get this infection in your bowels, which leads to really fun symptoms like nonstop diarrhea. Um, so definitely want to tell patients to report any diarrhea they have after their antibiotics. Now, all antibiotics can cause some diarrhea, but uh, there's definitely just want to kind of tell them about what that might look like with C. diff. Um, we always want to consider allergies. A lot of people have allergies to antibiotics. So we always want to let them know, let us, um, you know, like we want to ask about allergies first and specifically to any antibiotics, what happens. We always want to check kidney function because uh, most antibiotics are pretty hard on the kidney. So again, this is something the pharmacist is going to check, but you should be aware too and kind of know, like as the nurse, even if the pharmacist is like, hey, this patient is safe to get this antibiotic. If you're given five or six medications that are all hard on the kidneys, you need to know as the nurse, what else can you do to help support that function? Uh, we want to watch out for GI symptoms. Like I said, almost all of these, um, they're very like antibiotics are hard on the GI symptoms uh, system and can lead to a lot of nausea and stuff like that. So giving it with food, it's better tolerated. Um, there's a lot of hospitals that are now doing IV push antibiotics. And even though some patients can tolerate these, um, it's very, um, it's uh, it's very hard for some patients, and I know some patients, they have to get anti-emetics or anti-nausea medications first before they can even tolerate it. Usually they should start feeling better in three to five days. And if they're not, we may need to do a, another culture um, to make sure that we're actually treating the correct infection. And then make sure to tell them to finish the entire course of their antibiotics um, to make sure, because it helps to prevent resistance for future infections. Because if people are not finishing their antibiotics, then pretty much these, but they, most people take antibiotics till they feel better, not until actually they're, um, the infection's gone, so they should finish, follow all directions, finish them the full seven days, whatever it might be. So what do we do to make it better? Um, so what I want to do as the nurse is I want to get secretions up and keep that airway patent. So I'm going to encourage fluid intake to thin those secretions, um, do things like chest percussion therapy, or um, uh, which I'll talk about here on the next slide, I believe. Um, and so that's going to help to um, get stuff up and get stuff moving. 
Um, and then um, turn coughing and deep breathing is super helpful in these patients. Um, just this, the mobilization or moving around of secretions and that movement is super helpful. It helps with drainage. Um, and then getting up and getting moving, regular repositioning is key too. Uh, encouraging oral hygiene is helpful for these patients because um, if you don't have good oral hygiene, you're gonna have a higher chance of getting bacteria in your lungs. Um, incentive spirometry too, keeping those alveoli non-collapsed um, so that we can continue to prevent them from having um, problems with their uh, problems with pneumonia coming back, et cetera. With the higher risk, remember atelectasis, you should think pneumonia. So how can we support oxygenation and ventilation? So keeping the head of bed elevated helps because it really helps with expansion. We'll talk more about this with COPD, um, but if I'm like leaning and laying like far back, um, it's not going It's not going to be as helpful and easy for me to uh, expand back. Because most people think with your lungs that you're expanding up out like, like, you know, like my chest is going up, but there's a lot of expansion happening in the back. So if I'm sitting upright, especially like in an upright position where my back can also expand out, that's going to really help with my ventilation. Um, swallowing and gag reflex before food. So this is gonna help to prevent aspiration pneumonia. I need to make sure that the patient's safe to swallow. This is especially important after stroke patients, which we'll talk about later this semester. Uh, and then they may re receive some respiratory inhaled therapies like steroids, bronchodilators um, that may be helpful to them. And then as needed, they may need supplemental oxygen. Um, and so this is, uh, this is some pictures of um, some, uh, what we call, what is it called? Oh, where was I? Um, it's, it's along with chest percussion therapy. What am I, why am I losing my, um, it's postural drainage. There it is. It came to me. So postural drainage. And so what, um, what this does is it's showing positions that a patient can get in to help, like depending on where their, the like mucus is, which position is going to help in order to, um, position them to get those secretions up. So what usually happens, and I think, I, I think I have a different slide for postural drainage. So I'll talk more about it then, but yeah, if I don't, I'll come back. Um, let's see. Hmm. Maybe did I lose it somewhere? I'm just looking real quick to see if I have it somewhere else. Hmm. Wonder where. Oh, maybe I talk. I think I talk about it later in COPD. That's where I talk about it. But yeah. So we'll talk more about this when we get to COPD. But um, yeah, postural drainage it helps to drain when you have too many secretions. But we'll talk about CPT when we get there. So how can we make them more comfortable and support healing? So nutritional therapy is important for these patients. They may not really feel like it's hard to eat and breathe at the same time. So they may not feel like um, eating a lot. So small frequent meals are helpful um, and encouraging foods that are high in calories and nutrients as well so that they can um, heal from that. Because with infections, we definitely want them getting their vitamins and things like that. Um, splinting helps. And so splinting is where you take that pillow and put it against their chest, especially if they're having chest pain with breathing, it's gonna be so helpful. Um, and then reducing pain and fever with uh, medications like acetaminophen. Overall, like with influenza, um, good health habits and hygiene are important. Hand washing, proper nutrition, adequate rest and regular exercise, avoiding irritants like cigarette smoke and crowds with those um, and those that have infection is key. Um, and then there is a vaccine too for pneumonia. You may not have heard of it because you're like, wait, I don't think I've gotten that one. So usually um, the people that are people that get are those that are at risk that are very young or very old. Um, and those with certain medical conditions like weak immune systems, lung heart disease, diabetes, things like that, people with autoimmune conditions. Um, you just get this one once um, and it helps protect you from pneumonia. And um, oh, also those who smoke, I have down here, those who smoke or have asthma may be at risk too and need to take it. You just get it once and it helps prevent. So this is something else. And I'm not saying everyone under two and everyone greater than 65. Um, but it's young and old with certain medical conditions. Um, so you're going to see this commonly. And as a nurse, you're going to see this, uh, a screening for this, that if your patients are a certain age and it's, um, they're going to say, hey, have they received their pneumonia vaccine? All right. So one major disease down, a few more to go. Let's talk about tuberculosis. Um, so tuberculosis is another infection, but it's a specific bacteria that's um, causing this. It's what's called mycobacterium tuberculosis. And effectively with tuberculosis, it, uh, it usually involves the lungs, but it can become a systemic problem. Um, and we're gonna talk about latent versus active on the next slide, but um, effectively it's, it's a lot, we have it as its own separate thing because it's treated very differently. There's specific treatments for them, but it's also very different of what causes it. And then also, um, 
some of the symptoms that they have with it or the show and then like the actual treatment, not just the drugs, but how long they need to be treated for. Like no, most pneumonias, you know, you could be better in a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months if you're older and really um, compromised with tuberculosis. This is more of the long haul kind of illness. Um, so it's very serious and it, it is considered a public health issue. Um, so, um, cause compared to pneumonia, this one is airborne. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But anyway, risk factors for this are going to be homelessness or those that are living and working in areas where people congregate, like prisons, um, long-term care facilities, and hospitals. Um, also, those that are immunosuppressed are going to be more at risk. So let's talk about this latent versus active, because a lot of people find this confusing. Um, so latent tuberculosis means I've been exposed to tuberculosis and have the bacteria in my body. But what the body does for people that have strong immune systems, um, you know, that may have, uh, that are like young, healthy, et cetera, um, your body, your immune system encapsulates that bacteria and hides it. And so pretty much like if you, if you have latent tuberculosis, you can't spread it to other people. You may still require some treatments, but you're not going to need as, as much or as long of a treatment as others may. Um, your TB test will show up as a positive, except, um, you know, like your skin tests and stuff like that, or your T spot, they'll show up as positive, except if you do a culture, um, it's going to show up as negative. Because remember, I said that culture is the most helpful thing to tell if I have an infection right now, because it tells me literally right now in my blood, in my urine, in my sputum, what is growing. Um, it grows whatever's coming from there. So I don't know if you remember back in microbiology, what we did in my micro class is that we took on one of those little, um, I'll call them pea pods. I know that's not what they're actually called. <laughs> yes. Um, that um, we put one, I put one in my bathroom and then I just saw what was growing in my bathroom today. Um, and so if I would have taken that the next day, I could have been growing something completely different. Um, but effectively, latent is not an active infection. They don't, they cannot spread it to others. They may need some treatment, um, but they're not as, it's not as dangerous as active tuberculosis, which means I've been exposed and have tuberculosis right now. I can spread it to others. I'm going to require long-term treatment. It's usually a six to nine month treatment at least. Um, and then all my TB, TB tests will show up as positive, including a culture because I have bacteria growing right now in my body. So like I mentioned, TB is airborne. In other words, um, like, you know, if I'm sitting in a room and again, like it's talking here, I have to have close, frequent, prolonged exposure. A lot of times, like, you know, you can get freaked out because you're taking care of a patient. You come back two days later and they're like, oh, by the way, they have tuberculosis. And you're like, oh, I spent all night with them. Oh my goodness. But you, it takes really close, frequent, prolonged exposure. And it depends on how many organisms are in the air, how small is the space, what length of time, and how strong is your immune system too. Um, it's not necessarily that just because you're around someone with TB that you're going to get it. So, but regardless of that, it is a public health crisis. And in a hospital, there's a lot of people that are at risk and there's a lot of small spaces. So we are going to isolate is a priority. Uh, isolation is a priority for the nurse to get this patient in isolation. So we put them in because it's going to take a while to do diagnostic tests on them to see if they actually do have TB. So we put them in isolation um, in what's called a um, negative pressure room. Um, and um, uh, wear special N95 masks that are to help to prevent um, airborne transmission and um, follow those precautions, which I'll talk about on a different slide. Um, we can spread this through breathing, talking, singing, sneezing, and or coughing. So what does this patient look like? I said they look a little bit different. So they're going to show signs of an infection, but it's a little bit more insidious how it comes on. Um, usually symptoms are going to start two to three weeks after infection or reactivation. I didn't talk about this, but with latent TB, when I said like, hey, latent TB, it's less serious because you can't spread it. Um, what I should mention is that if I have, let, let's say I have latent TB right now, is that, um, which I don't, don't worry. And, and you can't catch it through this YouTube video if you're scared, um, even if I did have latent TB. <laughs> but let's say that I had TB that was latent um, and it's just sitting there. I have a healthy immune system, so I don't really have to worry about spreading that to anyone else. But let's say later in my life I get cancer and then my immune system is compromised. At any point that encapsulated TB that's just chilling and my immune system can open and reactivate. And same, even if someone has active tuberculosis, eventually it encapsulates, um, you know, gets treated, but eventually it can always come back. And so we're gonna talk about how patients always need to know the symptoms of what it looks like. Um, Cause again, these can be a little insidious or kind of creep up on you. Um, so a TV can always come back um, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, so even if I have latent, I can eventually, I can have latent and then eventually have active. Um, even if I don't have latent when I first, or act, even if I don't have active when I first get tuberculosis, I can get active at a later time. So symptoms are going to start two to three weeks after infection or reactivation. 
Um, and early on, it's going to be more like general symptoms. They're kind of weak, tired, not eating. They might complain of a dry cough. Um, and they usually have night sweats um, as well. That night sweats is kind of one of those key symptoms that NCLEX and other test, um, test writers love to use as like one of those hallmark symptoms. And then for late, they're going to be coughing up blood or having trouble breathing. So if they're at this point where they're having trouble breathing or coughing up blood, this is not an early thing that's going on. It's been going around for a while. So diagnosis for tuberculosis is tricky. Uh, most people think of, because, you know, when, in healthcare, we get those um, TB tests, um, you know, and we, uh, we get the skin test and we have to go back two days later and have it looked at. So that's great if you don't have tuberculosis, but if you've ever, if you have latent or if you've ever been exposed to tuberculosis or had a recent, like a, it could be a forever ago exposure or a recent exposure, it doesn't tell you anything aside from at some point in your life, you have been exposed to or been around TB to the point where your body has built up some sort of immune defense. So it doesn't tell you a lot, it just tells you, hey, it's come back positive. There is a, a T spot, which is a blood test. It's more expensive, but it doesn't require that follow-up check. So a lot of hospitals like to do that now where you don't have to have so much staff to come back and read the, the thing on the arm, the intradermal injection. Um, a lot of students think chest x-ray is going to be the most definitive or best thing. Um, but here's the thing is, is that a, a chest x-ray alone cannot definitively diagnose TB. We can look at a chest x-ray and say, hey, there's like cavications or something. I, I'm probably saying that word horribly wrong, um, but there's like, there's signs of tuberculosis on a chest x-ray, but I can't definitively diagnose that someone has tuberculosis right now just on a chest x-ray. But I can use it as a way to rule things out. So in other countries, tuberculosis has been more of a crisis, um, more of a problem. Um, and so um, they have vaccines in other countries, one, um, notably like up in England, they have the BCG vaccine. Um, and this is, it's other places than England too, but I'm just giving it as an example. Um, so a lot of people have received that. So these patients, what they do, if they have no symptoms, and then we look at their x-ray and see that they do not have any of those um, abnormalities like I was talking about, then we can pretty just to distinctly say, hey, they don't have TB. And we have to do that because if we give them the TB skin test or the T-spot, they're always going to come back positive. That's why I said the TB skin test and the T-spot, um, they're great for patients that have, or patients or, um, you know, I was going to say faculty, but, um, you know, uh, nurses that have never been exposed or had it. But if you've had this BCG vaccine, you're always going to test positive for that. So I need something else to do. So the nurses that um, have had that BCG vaccine, I've worked with many before, um, they end up having to get yearly chest x-rays instead of getting the other test. So then I have starred down here, the golden standard for diagnosis, which is going to be a sputum specimen, which again, tells us me right now, do I have anything? growing um, in my sputum. We have to do three consecutive sputums for diagnosis, and it can take weeks for those definitive results. Um, but usually we start, we're obviously going to start treating. We're not going to just wait, and we're going to start treating them and stuff. Um, uh, what I mean is when I say, I'm not talking about necessarily medications, but we're going to keep them in isolation um, and start um, assuming TB until we can start definitively diagnosing it and then get them into treatment ASAP. So there are a variety of medications and you'll see um, there's going to be more than this in your book, but these are the four medications that you need to know. These are some essential TB meds. Um, we'll talk about them more on the next slide. Um, there are different medications for, and like kind of how we set them up for drug resistant TB. And when I say that there's these four, I mean that they're getting all four of these, um, you know, a lot of the times uh, for active TB. For latent TB, they're not going to need as much treatment or as long of treatment, but they're still going to need treatment. Um, we can use a combination of the drugs to help improve the adherence to this. Um, like, you know, like some of these, like it's so hard to get people to, um, we're going to talk about, I'll talk about compliance here in a second, but it's really hard to people get people to comply with this medication treatment um, because it, it lasts at least six to eight weeks, but usually it's like six to nine months um, that they're going to need treatment. So compliance is super hard. So sometimes they've come up with some combination so you can take less pills a day. And then for some patients, because you have to remember about who gets this, it's going to be people like, you know, homeless and otherwise, they may not even have a place to store their medications. So they can get what's called DOT therapy. It's community therapy, direct directly observed therapy. They go into this clinic and they, on a daily basis, they're handed their medications to keep them compliant with it. So if you want to understand why there's a compliance issue, you have to look at what all these medications do. There are some serious, uncomfortable side effects with all these medications. So as a result of that, um, many people do not keep up with taking these medications. 
Um, so as a whole, um, as the nurse, it's important to know what are some of these side effects that I need to teach the patient around and then teach them the importance. Because again, this is like, if someone's just walking around saying, well, I don't want to take my TB treatment. Well, um, you know, it, it's hard. It's a public health um, concern. We're going to talk about this, but we do report this usually. Um, we report cases of TB to the health department so they can keep track of um, the prevalence that it is around in our area. But anyway, back to medications, your favorite part. Um, so there's medications for infection management, um, and all of these help to manage the infection of tuberculosis. Um, but like I said, they all have their toxic traits. Um, all of these are hard on the liver. So um, at, for every single one of these, I'm going to be concerned about their liver function. I need to regularly check their liver function. Um, so there's isoniazid or, um, you know, I have some mnemonics here. Isoniazid will set your nerves on fire or intoxication shouldn't occur. And this is reminding you as the nurse that this patient should not drink alcohol while taking this medicine. All of them hurt the liver, but specifically this one is super hard on the liver. So I want to make sure they're not drinking while they are taking this medication. Um, it can also cause purple neuropathy or uh, numbness, tingling, tingling, burning, or um, painful sensation. Um, in your extremities. So we definitely want to tell them about that and tell them to report that if it's happening. There's rifampin. Um, and so uh, this is a medication that will cause your secretions to turn red and orange, which is not a big deal, but you want to warn people about this because it's super scary to wake up and your secretions are not the color that they normally are. And you're like, wait, what the heck is happening here? Um, so yeah, so definitely want to report that. Um, and then the pyrazinamide, um, I, I have this one, it will make your joints hurt inside. So this one um, increases uric acid, which can lead to joint pain like a gout, um, which you'll learn about later this semester. And so, um, and then ethambutol can cause eye problems or decreased vision. So imagine this, you can't drink, your, um, your joints are hurting, you're having peripheral neuropathy, burning, numbness, tingling, um, your, or, uh, your urine and secretions are turning red and orange and you can't see. And someone's telling you, you gotta keep taking your meds. Now, I'm not saying that every patient that takes these gets all these side effects, but you can imagine why they would be hard to do. Some patients may take this and have no side effects, but it's really important that we um, keep a close eye on them because they're very toxic. So how else can we make it better? We're going to help with oxygenation and making sure that we give supplemental oxygen or oxygen therapy if they need it. Not all patients with tuberculosis have trouble with oxygen. If we catch it early, um, a lot of times they may not need it, but some patients need to be intubated or need more serious um, or even just supportive oxygen therapies. Uh, we're also going to do respiratory treatments like steroids, bronchodilators to help with some of that inflammation and um, help them to breathe easier. Head of bed being elevated again allows for that better lung expansion, allows for them to breathe better. And then I want to support their airway clearance. Um, repositioning every few hours, increasing fluid intake will help to get some of those secretions up as well. So then hygiene and teaching for tuberculosis. I'm going to put that patient, like I mentioned, on airborne precautions. And per the CDC, airborne precautions is just the mask in the room. Um, you know, yes, more than likely you're going to, um, a lot of people will wear the gown in there. You're going to be wearing gloves. Those are standard precautions though. So just keep in mind when we're talking about airborne precautions, we're talking about the N95 mask, which is a respirator, which you have to get fit tested for every year. Um, and then we're talking about the negative pressure room as well. Um, we're going to encourage hydration and nutrition um, in these patients, because again, this is kind of a long haul illness. So I want to make sure that they are keeping up with everything they need to heal from an infection. Um, I'm going to teach them. So remember how I said in order to diagnose, uh, I was going to say diabetes, excuse me, diagnose tuberculosis, <clears throat> that they have to have three consecutive sputum specimens. Well, that's to diagnose. To get cleared where they're considered non-infectious, they have to have two negative cultures. Um, so I'm going to tell them that before they can return to work, et cetera, their family may need to be tested because there's a good chance if they're living with anyone that their family may have that too. They teach them hygiene, like cover their nose and their mouth with tissues every time they cough, sneeze, or produce sputum. Um, adherence to that medicine regimen, not just when they're feeling better, they got to take it for that full length of time. And so how hard is it to take these medications for six, nine months? It's really hard, even for someone, um, you know, who's um, usually very compliant to keep up with this. Um, like I mentioned, your TB symptoms can come back, know the symptoms, and we do notify the health department about this because it is considered a public health issue. Anyway, I feel like this video has gotten pretty long and we talked about a lot of topics here. So I'm probably going to cut it here and do a separate video on asthma and COPD and oxygen therapy um, to kind of keep it a little bit more simple and not too overwhelming. Anyway, hope this helped. Have a great day.